Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how's your knee? Good. Reporting here from the hospital ward of the Atlas household. Sam Rivera was good enough to come in here and set me up in a different room with this professional mic and everything. Sam does a great job with us. I appreciate it as Rob Moore does and you and all of our crew. I I just got back, you know, the technology and medicine nowadays is just extraordinary. It it really is. It's mind boggling. I'm I'm at I'm getting my surgery tomorrow at HSS, Hospital for Special Surgery in Manhattan. And I was up there early this morning with my son and my wife. They brought me up there for pre op rehab. Can you imagine? I mean I got a <laughs> I got a fully torn MCL, fully torn ACL, bucket tears, meniscus, uh, fragments, whatever. Uh, you know, like like uh, a most like a friend of mine who's not a doctor. You know, he stayed in a Motel Eight. He, um, <laughs> Ken, you know what he said? He looked at all the report. He said, "If yeah, uh, this that it's a torn this is a torn." So somebody joking around, one of my friends said, so so what does it mean? His knee effed up. <laughs> His knee is effed up. But, um, <laughs> by the way, by the way, it's not just funny that your friend <laughs> weighs in, but it's he stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. I'm, I'm sorry. Tell you. <laughs> I'm oh, that's, sorry. that's even more perfect, though. I'm tell you. Uh, you know, it's Teddy Atlas here when he's... <laughs> Getting hotels wrong and names wrong. But, <laughs> no, uh, that sounds appropriate for your buddy who's giving you knee advice. <laughs> so, but it's extraordinary. I You got the best surgeons at ACES, HSS. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said last week, I'm very blessed that I have family, I have friends, I have all the people around me that Saudi Arabia, the people couldn't have been better that have been helpful to Tyson Fury. People couldn't be better. My family, my daughter, my son, my wife, all my friends, um, the the people here, the they went out of their way to to help me and get me set. So, but it's just crazy. I'm going. They're doing this morning. They had me doing rehab on the knee before the surgery, so to make it better for the recovery. And, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call that prehab. Yeah, prehab. And this way, the recovery goes easier. They had me stretching it. They had me doing some uh, uh, some some stuff on a machine. Uh, you know, pulling on a belt, pulling on a, on some of the on some of the bands. Just it's really you would. This could never have been. I mean, years ago, could you imagine years ago? even thinking about doing stuff before surgery. <laughs> That's crazy. It wouldn't even been a thought. But anyway, I I got that done this morning. I go in tomorrow. Uh, again, I'm just very fortunate. And it, it does it does humble you, make you think about, you know, just think about things that sometimes we take for granted. How fortunate you are How to have family, to have... How many people get injured worse than me they don't have the ability to get the treatment I'm getting. And, you know, this is a great country. I mean, everyone gets good hospital care for the most part, but there's some people that can't um, to get the proper hospital care. And my charity foundation, that's why I started, to make sure I try to do what my father did with the foundation, that everyone gets the proper treatment uh, despite their position in life they will all get what they need to get if they're sick or god forbid you know in a bad situation with family members children whatever and um I, it just it, it reminded me that how fortunate i am really uh to be able to not only not only get the proper care but to have people to care for you Yep. I mean, I, I think about the people, the foundation, our foundation helps Ken, and these people have nobody. I mean, literally, they, 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 don't, they don't have family, they don't have friends, they, 
they're, they're isolated in some cases, you know, from the world and all alone. That's why the work that you guys do at the foundation is so important. And to anyone watching this, if you'd like to get involved with the foundation, the Thursday before Thanksgiving, probably around the 15th, 16th of November, uh, Teddy hosts a big charity dinner in Staten Island. Everybody's welcome. Tickets go quickly, though, so you got to buy in advance and uh, come say hello to Teddy, myself, Rob, Sam, and a whole host of celebrity uh, celebrities from the fight world uh, at the Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner. And we could probably put a link in the show notes to uh, for anyone that's interested. I just want to say, you know, I'm thankful that I'm very thankful for having the things that I have. And I understand now why my father, even better, so many years ago, built a hospital on Staten Island with 22 beds in it. He actually built the hospital. So even back then, before there was something called Obamacare or HMOs, <laughs> you know, and he built a hospital with 22 beds in it, and it lasted for 23 years. And he built it so that people that didn't have the ability to get proper hospital care would get it. And he would take them in there, you know, uh, and cover the cost. And the people that had insurance, had the ability to pay, obviously they paid, so that, that kept the hospital going, obviously. And then the rest of it, he, if, like I said, if he had to absorb it, he absorbed it. But um, it, it, it strikes home the need uh, for such things. It really does strike home when it happens at home. And again, it just makes you grateful for what you have. Anyway, let's get to boxing. Uh, first thing, Ken, I just wanted to, I just got a, my son just hit me up. Roberto Duran, there was a report out that he's got some heart issues and he's being tested in his native Panama. One of my favorite fighters of all time. Um, I know I know my uh, my good friend Pedro Martinez, He he also hit me up telling me about Duran. He loves him. But I, I love Duran, and I I actually had a fighter in training camp with him up in, uh, where was it? It was in Grossinger's, I think, so many years ago. He was training for the first Sugar Ray Leonard fight, which he won, and I had a, one of my fighters up there small with him every day uh, up at Grossinger's, and I would take him up there every day from Catskill. I'd go there and, and be with him and then go back to the gym in Catskill to train fighters. When, when we got done with that session. But uh, I really love Duran. And I they haven't been specific about it, just that he has some blockage, some testing going on with his heart, you know. Uh, so obviously, I just wanted to say that I'm sure I'm speaking for all the fans that our prayers are out there, that uh, the hands of stone uh, will be okay. And um, also, as long as we're on some some uh, reporting, I want to just touch, there's a rumor that just came out that the Keith Thurman, Tim Zoo fight uh, might be canceled. It's just a rumor, just a rumor. But, oh, no. Yeah, and Thurman, look, Thurman has been prone to injuries. You know, he's been very inactive. His last fight was almost two years ago, uh, February, February 5th, 22. And then before that, he was... He hadn't fought since two. His last fight was 2019, so very inactive. Um, yep. He's been through a myriad of of injuries, shoulder injuries, whatever. Uh, so we don't know what this is. We don't even know if it's uh, confirmed. It's not confirmed. So we just know that there's a rumor out there that there's a possibility. Again, a possibility. Uh, but when you hear that it's Keith Thurman, you say, "Well, he's been injured before." Obviously, you pay attention. Yeah. So. Um, and also, when you fight that infrequently, it's like hard to get people. I, I like Keith Thurman, but it's hard to take fighters seriously that fight once every two, three years. It's like, what's the, you know, like Chill Sonnen would say, like, why should we pay attention to you? You don't seem to care. Why should we? There was a time, I, I hear you. There was a time when um, when Keith was, I almost had him to face a boxing. He was, yep. I mean, he was that prominent. 
Yep. And, you know, with PPC coming out on ESPN and all that stuff, uh, I was I caught his first fight on ESPN with PPC. And um, I, I thought that he was the most athletic boxer in the business at that time. I'm going back already uh, quite a few years. But I thought he was the best athlete in boxing at the time. Uh, you know, a well-rounded fighter. You know, he showed plenty of heart when he had to go in there and go toe-to-toe. And and you know in the spots, uh, in the spots that he did have to go toe to toe, he mixed up boxing. But when he had to go in the trenches, he did, uh, and and he showed, he showed the ability to do that. Um, and in that fight, uh, what, what was that fight? It was on CBS. It did a pretty good number. I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was. Uh, he fought uh, uh, Dan- Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, Collazo, yeah, Sean Guerrero. Porter. Yeah, yep. Sean, Porter. Sean Porter. So in that fight, it was a. Tre- I think it was on CBS. It was a tremendous fight. Uh, he he showed plenty of heart. Of course, Porter always showed plenty of heart too. Um, but I, I I think part of the thing that happens. I was going to say part of the problem with Keith Thurman, from my at least from my perspective, is that he. He made a lot of money. That's right. And you know, it's it's hard, it's hard to want to continue in this business at that level when you get comfortable. And look, you you fight and you take the risks that a kid like him takes since the amateurs, so you can get comfortable, so you can make money, so you can have that kind of life and take care of your family. And he got there. He made a lot of money with Al Haven. Al Haven's fighters made a lot of money, um, and. You know, I I think that uh, the injuries came too, but I I think that the the hunger uh, to want to continue to to do the things that uh, are difficult to do in this business when you don't have to do it at the same level of urgency that you did when you didn't have money, uh, not everyone could do that. I think it affects people. It does affect people. We're human, so I think that had an effect on on Thurman to quote one of my favorite fighters of all time, and I miss him, the late, great Marvin Hagler. You know, it's hard to get up and do road work at 5 in the morning when you're sleeping in silk sheets, you know? And uh, he, you couldn't have hit it more on the button than that when Marvin Hagler came up with that um, great quote. So uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if, if that fight does take place. Uh, I, I like Zoo. He's got a nice style. Uh, he's a fan friendly. He's strong. I, I think he's still a work in progress. I think he's still uh, improving in his fights, or, or there's room for him to continue improving. But I, I do like, I do like his style. Of course, he's popular over there where his father came from in Australia, or at least where his father did his fighting and moved there uh, to do his fighting. So, anyway, uh, hopefully, hopefully that's that's. Hopefully Thurm is fine, and that fight's gonna that fight's gonna take place. Where do you yeah. want to go? Where do you want to go? Let's start with um, King Callum Walsh. Uh, runs his record to ten and zero with eight knockouts. He beat Darren Yel- Yelusunov. Uh Ninth ninth round TKO stopped him late in the rounds. Um, overall, just solid performance in a step up in uh, competition. I thought Callum Walsh looked really good. I think that his handlers are probably happy to see him get rounds in and get the early and to get the late stoppage to show continued heart and uh and conditioning to get that stoppage in the ninth. How'd you like that one? Yeah, I look, it probably serves him pretty well. It it didn't serve me to put him on my list of guys to watch for in the future or to be really high on. Um and I disagree just a little bit with you with the step up in opponents. I he fought uh Yelusinov who's eleven four and one. Um this is the second time Yelusinov has been stopped now. He's thirty seven years old. He is a southpaw, just like Col- Colin Walsh is a southpaw. But I didn't really consider it a step up. I thought it was another well chosen opponent. They they do what everyone does with the prospects up. I'm not targeting him uh, to knock him. I'm not at all. Uh, but he's fought very very carefully selected opponents. 
Uh, and again, everyone does it. He's he's now ten and zero, eleven and zero, I guess now. Uh, is it eleven and zero or ten and zero now? He, I was think he moved to. Go? I think he moved to ten and zero. Um, so yeah, that's he's what ten I and zero. He's twenty three years old. He's young. Uh, I think it's time to step up a little bit now. I'm gonna be more. I'm I'm gonna kind of move him to say he's a prospect. He's a young kid. I'll, for a minute, I'll move him to Irish prospects. I don't think he's the top Irish prospect coming up. I know he's got. Dana White behind him. That's tremendous. Tremendous. He fought on fight pass. You couldn't ask for a better guy behind you. But I, I I rate a guy like Patty Donovan, who, again, full disclosure, Keith Sullivan is a lawyer for my foundation. He manages him with Andy Lee, the former world champion, who also managed, also trains uh, Joe Parker, who just had that big win over Zhang over in in Saudi Arabia, where I was when I got this injury, uh, and and he won, he won the uh, interim heavyweight title or one of the interim heavyweight titles, but I, I I would rate Patty Donovan ahead of him. Just as a I look at him, I say, you know what, he's a better prospect. He he's thirteen and old, Patty, so about the same range of opponents. But Patty's now fighting better opponents. I think it's time for Walsh. Now, all these guys have good amateur backgrounds, so I, they don't need 100 pro fights to get ready to step up a little bit. They've already had 100-plus amateurs on, for most cases. So I think it's time to step up a little bit. But again, I'm here to give you my unvarnished opinion. And he... I don't see one great area of talent for Colm. I know he's got the famous trainer, Freddie Roach, with him, and I'm sure that will that will bode well for him in his career. But uh, I see a guy with good legs. I see a guy that's tall and wiry, uh, that's got good length on his arms. <laughs> um, I, I see a guy that I think he's more prone to counterpunch. He counterpunches pretty well. I think that's his temperament. I think that's more of his natural instinct and comfort level. Uh, and if you want to say that would be his wheelhouse to be a counterpuncher, to box on the outside, use his jab, control range. But he's a fighter. He's got that temper. And when he tries to be aggressive, I see him fall in. I see him uh, overshoot his opponents, uh, not really controlling his balance as he starts to close the gaps, he gets, as I just said, he gets too close. He falls in. He falls into a lot of clinches. He does a lot of clinching, a lot of holding on the inside. And look, he, he fought a carefully selected opponent who was shorter than him, uh, where you could say, Teddy, he was being smart to grab on the inside, not fight on the outside, fight on the, not fight on the inside, fight on the outside where he's got the edge because he's taller and he's longer and the other guy doesn't have a chance on the outside. Okay, I'll give you that. But there were so many spots where he grabbed and clinched on the inside where it wasn't like, it wasn't like his opponent was being Jake LaMotta on the inside. You know what I mean, Ken? It was like he could have done some fighting, but he was more inclined to, you know, grab, clinch, uh, yeah. get back on the outside. But then when he got back on the outside, when he wanted to be aggressive, which I give him credit for, he fell in again. He would, as I described earlier. So, uh, again, I, I thought that he doesn't, I don't think he's a good inside fighter. Uh, I don't think he's learning. Maybe Freddie will teach him that. Maybe Freddie doesn't want to teach him that. Maybe Freddie figures, hey, he's going to he's gonna make his hay on the outside. If he's going to make it in this business, it's going to be with the long arms. It's going to be with the tall body. It's going to be with the jab. It's going to be with his counterpunching abilities that I just said are pretty good. All right, but... I like to teach guys to fight on the inside because sooner or later, one day, you, 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 you're going to need it if you're going to be around long enough. You, you're going to need it, even if it's not for the whole fight, even if it's just to you know, work for you in, in spots to keep the other guy from getting taking control of you or getting too confident or getting too aggressive. Um, 
I, I just like to have guys well-rounded. He still has to learn to do a little inside fighting, I think. Uh, his opponent, as he said, uh, handpicked, uh, shorter guy, slow, one-dimensional, very predictable, always coming straight in, actually very slow coming in, plodding with his legs, uh, not, you know, most of his punches were with a little fat on them, a little, little, a little wide, uh, not fast hands, uh, like I said, wide punches with no power. At the end, I... Uh, late in the fight, the referee stopped. So he got the rounds, like you said. That's good. But I still don't have an idea, Ken, of why the referee... You watched it, right? Yep. I Can you tell me why the ref stopped it? Because from my vantage point, I don't know why the ref stopped it. He didn't, he didn't get hit anything significant. He didn't get hurt. Um, and it was at the... It was at the theater i think at, in uh, madison square garden i think it was in a smaller theater at the garden in new york because you know he, he's gonna be popular he's uh Correct. Or, or no yep. right i think it was yep. yeah um, it was and and uh, you know around st patty's day or or maybe it was on st patty's day i don't even know but no day, uh, day before was friday night st patty's day was sunday but i think you just you you just answered the question yourself St. Patty's Day, he's the star of the show. <laughs> I mean, he had the kid in trouble. I wouldn't say he was in danger of imminently getting knocked out cold, but I think that, like a lot of cases, they're just looking for a reason to give the result that basically, like, people are looking for. In, and by people, I mean promoters, the fans. Not to take anything away from the kid Walsh, but I think the ref was just a little bit, a little bit, uh, you know, too quick on the trigger, maybe. And I think he also knew that the kid was getting beat up pretty good. But, yeah, to your point, he was didn't look like he was in any Im imminent danger at that moment. I'll give you this, Ken. It was a one-sided fight. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, Walsh dominated the fight. Uh, won every round. And clearly... So, and the other kid, looked. the other kid was game, he was trying, but he was limited. But he was coming forward in the same pattern all the time, very predictable. But like I said, showing heart, trying. But at the end, I, I guess you could justify the stoppage just by the referee saying, hey, look, it's a one-sided fight. Uh, there's only one guy winning. Uh, there's, there's no sense in... You know, this is as good a time to stop it as any. No sense in going going any further. So, anyway, the referee stopped it. Nobody complained. You know, I, I just didn't see anything that caught my eye that warned me. Usually when it's a stoppage like that, you get a little warning. Like, okay, it's coming. They're going to stop it. and or Or if it's sudden, it's because it's a colossal punch. You know, it's a, it's a significant punch. But... It was none of those things, but I guess just the fact that he was so far behind and it was a futile uh, effort at that point to continue. So, anyway, next. Next up, Floyd Schofield against the dirtiest fighter we've seen in at least a week, Astori Suero. Uh, fight gets, he gets disqualified in the fifth round. Schofield moves to 17 and 0. Suero goes to 13 and two. Just this looked like a classic example of a guy who like realized he was in so tough and almost at, I, it felt like he was intentionally trying to get disqualified versus losing yeah, the fight. That way. You know, it, it, I think you're mom, right. I mean, Ken, I think you're right. Ken, this guy, this guy had a rap sheet going in, you know, <laughs> Not he had a, uh, but I mean a rap sheet, not a criminal rap sheet on the streets. I mean a rap sheet in the same way, but uh, as far as being dirty. He, yeah. This is a guy, this is a guy, I think in his last fight, he bit a guy twice. Oh, my I mean, God. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's what they, they said, what the commentators said. But that's either way. That's one that's hard to come back from. I mean, biting someone, it's just like, to me, when I see someone bite someone, they have no control over their actions at that point. They're like running purely on re responding to their emotional impulses. Like, oh my God, I'm in too, too tough. I'm going to bite him. I can't hit him anymore. I'm going to, it just shows 
a lack of control, you know. It shows a mental weakness. It 100%. shows a mental weakness, but that you're trying to get out, and that's the only way you can figure to get out. But um, or you don't want to fall down and get out and find the soft spot because then everyone will know. It's almost like a frantic panic reaction, like, you know, instead of, Stop, drop, and roll. You're like screaming fire and like knocking people over. Like, calm down, relax. Don't stop biting. That's there's other well, ways the to option, get out of there. Well, the option is one of the options is to just you know to quit, and then they don't want to be labeled with this. So somehow they think that it. I don't know. They think that it save them from being labeled as a quitter. But people I don't know what's dumb. worse. Pe- people aren't that dumb. I it's mean, the some same people exact are very end dumb. results. That, to me, yeah, that's some, the same result. Well, people figure it out. Yeah, exactly. So his reputation preceded him as a dirty fighter because the commentator said he's known as a dirty fighter. That's not yeah. good when you get in the ring. <laughs> and You know what I mean? It's yeah, one thing exactly. that they say, this guy's known to switch from lefty to righty. You know, this guy's known to, you know, uh, start to get, you know, he, he runs out of gas sometimes a little late in a fight. Oh, but Teddy, this- he- even if you had like a Bernard Hopkins who had, <clears throat> I wouldn't say dirty, but he definitely resorted to rough tactics. He did everything he could to win the fight. And uh, so, you know, I think that um, I think that there there's a fine line, though, between being rough and being dirty. Right. Dirty is like this guy was dirty. The way he behaved yeah, was dirty. Yeah, very much, Ken. And uh, I mean, you bit a guy twice. You fight before, and you, and then in the fight, he picks him up. He gets a point taken away early for picking him up in the air. They take a point. Then, like a round later, he picks him up and throws him to the ground. Yep. And and then and then he, you know, he just kept doing it till he finally got, you know. And then he hits him low, not once but twice in a row. Yeah, like, it's crazy. To, you know, for to make sure, you know. <laughs> It's, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, it's yeah, like it was just, in, just in case the first one didn't get the effect <laughs> I wanted, he doubled it up. He doubled yeah. up a low uppercut, uh, and that's that's when he got disqualified, I believe. But yeah. uh, up until that point, uh, and Suero has a good record. He's thirteen and one. He's got some skills too. You know, yeah. he's just not. His, he don't have skills mentally. He's not strong right. mentally, and that's the most important part of this business and anything really. But he's he was thirteen and one with ten knockouts, I believe, going in. And uh Floyd Schofeld is a prospect who's sixteen and 0, 12 knockouts, lightweights, uh De La Hoya, uh on the De La Hoya zone fight. And um Suero's tall, you know. He's tall, he's rangy, uh he can punch a little bit with the right hand. Uh he, he was looking to catch Schofield coming in. Schofield I'll tell you, he he jumps in. First of all, I didn't mind the leaping left hook. You don't see many guys. Floyd Patterson made it famous. Uh, Tyson used it a little bit. But the leaping left hook, I like it if it's used at the right time. Floyd Patterson used it to knock out Igor Mario Hansen to win back the heavyweight title. At that time, he became the first heavyweight ever to win back a title, ever. He got knocked out by Johansson the first time. Then a year later, he fights him in a rematch and knocks out Johansson with a leaping left hook that left Johansson on the canvas with his foot twitching. Well, with his left foot actually twitching, it was out cold. So I like the leaping left hook. If it's, again, if it's taught right, if it's used at the right time, it could be a great weapon. If it's used at the wrong time, it's a dangerous weapon because if you jump in with that left hook when the guy set the punch in front of you, he's going to beat you with the right hand. He, you know, because you're leading with it with a space where he has time to, you know, to time you with the right hand. So if you do it at the right time, what's the right time? When the guy's stepping back, he's not set to punch. Um, when your head's on the left, outside the right hand, he doesn't know that you're coming. You, again, you you watch his feet. His feet move back. You jump in from the a little bit on the side where your head's protected from the right hand. But if you do it when he's ready, again, uh, you can be you can be hurting yourself more than helping yourself because you'll run into a straight punch. Uh, in in particular, right hand. I, but it, it became more than that. He's he hurt he hurt 
Suero with a couple of leaping left hooks early on. And I liked it. But then he started getting so reckless with his coming in that he was jumping in. His head was getting way ahead of his feet, which should never happen. And he he caused himself a head clash, which he's done several times. You can see he's got scars, uh, this young kid, Schofield, who I like. I like his energy. I like his ability. I like his attitude. I like the way he talks after the fight. He's a good kid. Uh, and I, I'm rooting for him. But he's got to develop. Somebody's got to help him get rid of some of these reckless habits of jump. First of all, he's getting busted up. He got cut. He, he came in. He causes his own cuts uh, around the forehead. He got cut when he jumped in with his head uh, and, and clashed with uh, Suero. Uh, and then, he, he, like I said, he's been cut in prior fights uh, where he still has some scar tissue uh, from the same reason, jumping in and causing himself problems with head clashes with his opponent. He, that, that's one of the problems. He's going to get busted up. And he is getting busted up. But the other problem is he's, he's going to get caught punches jumping in. He, other than a leap and left hook that he used in a couple of spots when Suero, the tall guy, was stepping, and I loved it. Uh, Suero was tall. He stepped back straight. When you got a tall guy stepping straight back, you could do that because it's like a skyscraper in front of you. There's a lot of windows you could go break. You know, he's susceptible. There's a lot of target there. I loved it. But then when he did it later and he caused himself a head clash and and he he started jumping in with everything, he's got to learn to work his way in behind the jab where he's not so reckless with his aggression. And where he could be more productive. He could work his way in behind the jab, get in there, set himself, become a good inside fighter. He's a shorter guy. Become a good inside fighter. But when you jump in, you can't even do the work when you get in there. You wind up nullifying that because you wind up smothering yourself and not being in position with your feet to work anyway. So he's got to, somebody's got to school him on that. He's really got to, again, I like the kid a lot. I'm rooting for the kid. But someone's got to teach him, you know, how to get in behind the jab, bring his feet uh, in a more patient, controlled fashion, uh, moving his head, working his way in instead of rushing and lunging to get in. You know what he reminded me of? He reminded me of Sean Porter. Uh, now, I know that, what's his name, the, the kid that, He's got a title. Um, uh, I, I Somebody told me that, uh, oh, Shakur. Uh, Shakur Stevenson said, stop. I guess other people, I don't read the internet, so I guess that other people were saying the same thing as me. He reminds him of Sean Porter. And then Shakur Stevenson made a, a I guess he must have reacted, <laughs> and said, stop saying he reminds you of, of Sean Porter. Uh, Sean Porter was more developed. Yes. Yes, L later in his career. Early on, Sean Porter. Sean Porter used to jump in, used to reach in, used to lunge in, used to be over-anxious. Strong guy, Sean Porter. Big heart. His father trained him. World champion and what? Uh, Two-time world champion, whatever he was. He's retired now. Terrific. And, and does a good job commentating too. But yeah. he... He was reckless. He was a bull in a china shop early in his career. That's accurate. The, the fans out there that said that, I agree with you. I agree 100%. But then, as he progressed in his career, he started to settle down. His father settled him down. He started to use his jab more. He started to give himself some options. When he didn't come forward, he boxed a little bit. He picked his spots better. He didn't just rush in all the time and get reckless and leave himself open to counter punches by being reckless. Uh, he, he learned how to, he's a strong kid, Sean Porter. He learned how to use that strength in a much more controlled advantageous way uh as a pro fighter not just a brawler not just a 
you know, a PS6 guy, you know, just rushing into the joint and, and hitting whatever he's, whatever he hits, whatever's in front of him or whatever he sees first. So, again, the fans that said what I said, I didn't know you had said it until my son pointed it out to me from watching, looking at the internet. I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. He's got to do what Sean Porter did. He's got to calm down. He's got to settle down. And he's got to learn, learn to work his way in in a more effective, yeah. controlled, productive fashion. So anyway, uh, Schofield, uh, in a, I made some notes here. I guess in the third round, uh, another point was taken away, as I said, uh, as uh, Suero definitely worked hard to live up to his reputation, <laughs> you know, of being really a dirty fighter. Mission uh, accomplished. Yeah, really. Uh, so uh, at the end, I guess what, they stopped it, I guess, after the third. Uh, I guess it was the fifth. Uh, fifth. Oh, fifth round. Yeah. It was his uh, third dirty tactic in the fight. Uh, so anyway, again, I, I hope that this kid, really nice kid. I really liked his attitude, everything about him. Yeah, I liked this interview after the fight too. I really, it's so much better when, when the you can see the kid's a decent kid. You know, not just a decent fighter, but a decent kid. Uh, it, yes. it helps so. It, it helps you root for him. Anyway, yeah. I'm rooting. For, I'm rooting for that kid. I hope he does develop in those areas because yep. he, he he really needs to concentrate. He's got heart. He's got ability. You know, uh, he he's got all those things. He's got the intangibles. You know, of wanting to be a fighter. You know, of not letting anything stop me. Gets cut. He says, "So what? Come on, let's keep going." But he's got to learn the technical things. Uh, to to help him get to the next level. Yep. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's talk lightweights. William Zapata did exactly what uh, what most people probably expected him to do: relentless body attack to the uh, on Maxi Hughes. Zapata moves to thirty and zero. Gets the they, they the corner stops the the fight, and I think the fourth round. I'll confirm, but. Um, Zapata just looked exactly the way he was supposed to look as a uh, potential number one contender. And I think he does move himself to number one on, on a bunch of the different, um, different sanctioning bodies rankings. Um, Maxi Hughes though, strange poor guy. He, he came over to Vegas. I want to say a week or 10 days before the fight and they deported him. He didn't have the right visa. So they sent him back purely like clerical errors. He goes back to London. He spends, I think, a week in London. He's boxing at the um, – he goes to Ireland to box in Northern Ireland and then finally gets his gets his um, visa approved with, like, days to spare and flies over. And uh, so not the best preparation for Maxi Hughes, but uh, I don't know that any preparation would have helped him for what uh, Zapata was bringing to the table. No, that's – I'm glad you pointed that out, Ken. It's, it's a hard enough business, right? That you gotta be put through that. Oh, by uh, the way, one quick thing about that: he get listen to this. He gets to Vegas. They take him in the back. It, it, immigration to, or border control takes him in the back. They take his phone and his passport. So his team is in baggage claim. He can't call them. His phone's ringing incessantly. They literally put him back on the same exact plane going back to London. He couldn't get in touch with them until he got on the plane. They handed him the phone, and he was able to call his wife and tell his team, but. Just, I, I mean, listen, if, if, if there's a mistake to be made, cool, but, like, how about some compassion? You can go to the southern border and just walk right over the border without even checking with anyone, but this kid comes in and has the wrong visa. I mean, from England, he's not coming from uh, Iran or some country on the, like, watch list. It's no, just but a, even um, if he was, it's a shame. Even if he was, people from Iran, the watch list, all the stuff you just touched on, Ken, they, all they have to do is go over to the southern border that you just said yep. and walk over. It really is and, a and, shame. And really, I mean, just walk over. And and not only won't they get stopped, not only do they not to have to have papers or anything as far as the legal, the legalities of, you know, coming to this country used to be or supposed yep. to be, or the way they are with certain people like him. 
they they <laughs> definitely they they definitely made it they definitely stood to the book of doing you know proper uh, proper um vetting of somebody coming across but yet here's a kid coming over here to better his life to make a living to fight a fight and they don't let him come over they put him through all that oh and by There's the way by the way he the reason they his visa was bad th th everyone should know this if you're listening if you come into the u.s or any country to do work Unless you have a work visa in advance, if you tell them you're there to work without a work visa, they'll kick you right out. You need to be on a tourist visa. And I think had he just said, yeah, I'm on a tourist. I'm just here for touring and didn't tell them the truth. They would have let him in. I think that that's what happened. But I know yeah, that no, that's no, the I'm case. Sure. No, no, I think you're right. But again, the option to that would have been just come over the southern border. You know, and any of could've the entries could have got a plane ticket anywhere he wanted to go and probably a few bucks. We've had eight, nine, ten million people come that way. Crazy. Uh, completely unvetted. No legal papers, of, completely illegally. They come over here. And like you said, not only would he got here in time for the fight where he could have been rested, he would have been put up in a hotel, he would have been given a phone, he had a phone, he didn't know. But they would have gave him another phone if he need, needed it. Yep. They, they, That's they the would truth. No, it is the truth. I'm not being facetious. I they, know. they, they, uh, they would have, they, they would have given them, you know, stipends for money, uh, for food. Uh, again, they would have put them in a nice hotel. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe the next time that's the way they have to go, rather than go the the legal way. Maybe they got to come the illegal way. Uh, and and just, I, I, I don't know. If, I, I just read a story where they picked up somebody on a watch list coming over from one of the countries you just mentioned. This was like in the last day or two, and they came over and they they said, "What are you doing? What are you? Where are you going?" I think I think he was coming to New York. I'm not sure, but obviously some some city in the United States. And he said, "I'm coming over here to 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 blow things to blow up the place." <laughs> Did you hear about that? <laughs> yes. Yes, no, they I mean, to, no, they I mean, really, you can't make, like, yeah, you, can't make this, you can't make this, you can't make this up. I mean, I come know. across, what are you doing? I'm coming over here to blow up the place. Sam, imagine <laughs> that. I don't think you let him in, right? But, uh, and and this kid, what are you coming over here? This, this kid, Max, you use uh, a fighter, 26, 7 and 2, 34 years old, been fighting for most of his life, coming over here, fighting the number one contender. What are you coming over here? To make a living. I'm coming in. And I get the rules. I don't get yeah. me wrong. But but don't you got rules there, but no rules anywhere else. No yeah. rules here, but rules here. So it makes you wonder. It really does. You you would have thought that the handlers and promoters would like clue him in. Like if you don't have a work visa, don't tell them you're here to work. No one's gonna check it. It's just um uh, unfortunate, man. He paid the, the first price thing you want to say if you come across the border. I'm not here. To, I'm not here to work. I'm here to get a plane ticket to, you know. <laughs> uh, let me look at the paper where I want to go. Hold on a minute. <laughs> let me look at. It. I got a few places I picked out. Um, I, I I'd like to go visit Chicago. Um, <laughs> you know, I I'd like to go see the Windy City. You know, I'll go over there, <laughs> maybe take a cup game in or something. Crazy. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's. I'm, I'm not trying to be. Uh, I guess I'm being a wise guy, but I, I'm only being a wise guy because it's frustrating. And, Very and, frustrating. Anyway, you see a kid like this, use. He comes in as an opponent. He's 34 years old. He's 26, seven and two. Look, Cepeda. I said it about Walsh. I said it about Sepeda. They've been deloying them. They've been very careful about picking his opponents. And again, normal stuff, normal stuff in this business. But now at 30 and 0, I think he's 30 and 0 now, right, Sepeda? Yes, yep. Now, now it's 30 and 0. Come on. Well, he's going to fight better now. He's ready to fight for the title now. So he's going to do that. But I, I, I. I mean, Maybe he should have stepped up a little sooner to be prepared for what's coming. With Cepeda, it probably doesn't matter. He's a he's a tough kid. He's a real fighter. His temperament is to get to you. It's, it's not 
you know, it's not to get to know you or get to feel out around it. It's to get in the ring when the bell rings to go right to you and try to attack your body until you can't take it anymore and just keep applying pressure and pressure and pressure. You know, uh, the southpaw, used was the south, two southpaws in there. Uh, I, I like Cepeda. As fan-friendly as they get, uh, I don't know if he's if this style that he fights with Ken, if he's gonna be able to be successful at the next level with the top guys. Because again, well, we're about to find uh, out because he's too well, high yeah. in the rankings now to fight anyone other than like the people ranked ahead of him: Shakur Stevenson, Tank Davis, Vasily Lomachenko. Like a hundred percent. I mean, nowhere mean, else to go now. That's why for his development, I would have liked for them. If I had been involved, I would have said, hey, we got to step him up before he gets to this place where it's it's too late. He's, he's just going to have to fight the top guys with nothing in between, with no fights to have prepared him for this. I don't see where he's had the fights to really prepare for the next step where, okay, let's see if this style is going to work against the next level. If you stepped them up a little bit before, you would have got a better idea of that. You would have gotten a feel for that. And then you could make adjustments in the gym. Say, okay, look, you can't just be straight on aggressive. Uh, we we got to start fainting a little more. We got to start coming in off the side a little more. We, we got to start to tweak it a little bit. We got to start to, you know, add a little polish uh, to the to the brute ferocity that you bring to just getting to a guy and 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 taking a guy's will away and taking his body away. Um, but again, I would have liked to have stepped him up a little sooner. He's there now. It's going to be time to get in there with the top guys. Again, I don't know if his style, we're going to find out, like you said, is going to work against the very top. Uh, I love his aggressive style. Uh... I love the fact that he uses his jab really well. He's a southpaw. He uses that right jab to come forward, the right way to do it. I love it. Uh, he's got a good jab. It clears the way to get him in. He's 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 as fan-friendly, like I said a moment ago, as they come. Uh, he's a guy that he's only going to make good fights. He doesn't know how to do anything else. He throws a million punches. He's got great endurance. Uh, if he throws a million punches, half a million are thrown to the body. Uh, you know, uh, again, he uses his jab well to get there. Uh, he's, he's, I, I just, uh, I, I, I'm, I love following Cepeda. He's, he's going to be a guy I'm going to be very anxious to see how he does you know, I would assume in the next fight or two, when he fights probably for the title or or something at at the level just before the title, uh, and use he again he had a guy who was put through hell with his travel uh, that that didn't help use use had it's not a puncher he's a busy uh, smart guy who likes to counter. Uh, as I said, 26, 7, and 2. Use an experienced guy, but uh, a guy that, you know, uh, a guy that's well beyond uh, his best days or definitely beyond his best days. Uh, yeah. And he was just, he was there as an opponent uh, for Cepeda. Right. He got stopped in the, uh, the fourth round, the end of the fourth round, they stopped in the corner. The, the referee could have stopped it. He was taking a barrage of punches. Again, Cepeda does what he does. He gets on you, and he he, he don't stop. I mean, he yep. he's he, he's like a he's like a swarm of bees uh, <laughs> around the. Uh, That's a good uh, description. Uh, he really is. He's like I a know. swarm of bees around a, a honeycomb. He he just does not stop. Until you either hurt him and get rid of him, which hasn't happened yet, yep. or he gets rid of you. Like you said, it'll be interesting to see how he does against the next level. Because as you know, with that pressure ain't going to work when you're taking return fire and meaningful punches. Tough. Yeah, 
I, I wish the ref, I thought the ref could, I'm not here to knock the ref to the way I knock a guy if he deserves it completely, but I thought the ref could have stopped it in the fourth round uh, because he had taken a beating in the third. He, was, he took a terrible beating in the fourth, and it was just, it made no sense not to stop it. He let yeah. it go back to his corner. The corner stopped. I don't know if he told the corner to stop it or the corner. All I'm saying is this. Hughes is a proud, experienced guy. You didn't have to force him back to the corner where he might have to say, "I, I that's enough. You yeah. shouldn't put a fighter in that position. He's a, he, he fought as gallant as he could. And considering all the things you just pointed out with the travel and everything else that beat him down before he even got in the ring, you don't put him in a position where he might have to stop his own fight and do something that a fighter never wants to do, never should do, yeah. which is submit. So for me, if the referee stops it before he goes to the corner at the end of the fourth, you don't have to wonder now well, did he tell the corner to stop it? Did the corner stop? You save him that. You, 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 he deserves to be safe. His pride deserves to stay intact and not to put him in a position where he might have to say to the corner, I can't go on anymore. Yeah. It was perfect. For the referee to do that, I mean, there was no reason not to. But anyway, I am, um, I am looking forward now to see Cepeda what he does at this next level. I really am. Uh, yeah. You can't, you can't help but like the guy, Ken, uh, because again, he, he all he does is you know, you point him in the direction. You know that you want him to go. Okay, it's it's a little, it's north northwest. All right, <laughs> ready? Okay, go. <laughs> go, and yeah. and that said, he's going, and you know what he's doing. He ain't, you know, he he ain't introducing himself to you and saying, "Hey, my name is uh, Cepeda." No, he's he's coming, and he's just chucking leather at you. <laughs> That's right. Well. Speaking of prospects climbing up the rankings, uh, Jake Paul announces his next uh, opponent, Mike Tyson, who uh, I think is 56 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, curious to get your thoughts on this one. Clearly, this is a money fight. Um, I don't think it does much to uh, help Jake Paul in his advancement of as a pro fighter, but certainly delivers on the entertainment front, which I'm, I'm okay with. Um, what are your thoughts? Anyone who listens to the show knows that I give my props to Paul because he had a vision. He he came from YouTube, 20 million followers, whatever. He had a vision that he was going to get into boxing, and he acted on that vision. He said, I got to get a trainer. I think he's been to a couple trainers now. He said, I got to get a trainer. I got to learn the sport. I got to work. I got to respect the sport, and he did. And he picked his opponents as carefully as he could. But he fought some, you know, UFC former champs. Uh, they were older. They were they fought at a smaller weight. He always had an edge. The same way Canelo has an edge because Canelo's the golden goose. Canelo brings the money. So he gets an edge to, to you know, get things in his favor a little bit because, you know, he's the one who butters everyone's bread. Well, Paul is the one bringing the money, doing the promotion. So, yes, he gets the advantage of picking who he wants to, you know, picking the music for the songs, who he wants to dance with. Uh, that's the way it works. You bring the money, you get to pick. Uh, but he has risked himself. He has put himself in there. With uh, whether it was Woodley, whether it was I, I know it was an old uh, an old Silva, uh, who I thought was the greatest MMA fighter I ever saw. 
um, Anderson Silva. But Silva was old, but he still, Silva had beaten uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., who was, who did have a title, who was a champion. I know he's a guy who's a mess, hold, say, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., I know that, but he still legitimately beat him in a boxing match. Anderson Silva, Paul fought him. It was an interesting fight. Uh, he, he also fought Tommy Fury. He lost a close decision. So he has put himself at risk. He fought Nate Diaz, uh, who, who's as tough as they come, you know, the legendary UFC fighter. Again, I, I know Diaz was uh, at the older part of his career. I get it. I know he fought at a lighter weight than Paul. I get it. But still, He's a professional fighter. He's a monster of a man, uh, a monster of a fighter. And, and Paul still put himself in that realm of risk. I give him credit for the, what he's done, what he's achieved. He had the vision. He acted on it. And, you know, you sketch out a vision. And then you got to go color it. He went and he started coloring it in. And now he picks... He, it was time to shake things up a little bit, I think. So he's shaking it up with Mike Tyson, a legendary fighter, heavyweight champ, the whole thing. And Mike, Mike will be 58 at the end of June. So look, we understand all that. This is where I'm going to throw people a curveball and, call you, and throw you a curveball too from the way you set it up, which, which is the way everyone's setting it up. It's, it's ridiculous. He's fighting Tyson. He's 58 years old, blah, 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 blah. First of all, he's actually fighting a guy who finally, I know he's, he's much older than him, but is naturally the bigger guy, uh, you know, because Paul fights at about cruiserweight, 190. So this guy's naturally the bigger guy. He's fighting a legendary, iconic fighter. The last, a guy who's one of the greatest punchers in heavyweight history, one of the greatest punchers ever with either hand, and one of the greatest combinations of speed and power. Yeah, he's 58 years old. Yeah, the end of his career wasn't too good uh, before he got out. But one of the last things that go with a fighter is his power. I mean, I, I'm testament to that. I had Michael Mora fight George Foreman, one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Talk about icons. Yeah. And a great man, not just a great fighter, but that's where I, that's where I like to, uh, I, I like to see a guy who's a champion in the ring and outside the ring, and and give Tyson all the credit in the world. He's what he's done to to straighten his life out and and seems to be in a a good place now, a productive, happy place. Good, good for him. But George Foreman, for me. One of the greatest heavyweights ever, uh, just like Tyson is, but and and a just I I think a great man, I think uh, a great example, a great role model that you could do anything if you put your mind, even when you're older. And Foreman did; he won the title over my fighter when he was 45 years old, over over Michael Mora. Uh, Michael was winning every round, every minute of the round, going into the tent, and he got caught a punch he never saw by by the great George Foreman, and uh, you know, and all credit to Michael because he he came back after that and won the heavyweight title again. After that, I mean, you talk about something that's devastating. He comes back a year or two later, Michael, and wins the title against Axel Schultz. In Axel Schultz's country, hometown, outdoors in a soccer stadium on ABC television in Germany. Uh, yeah. Michael Mora, he, I'm glad he just got elected into the Hall of Fame because he deserves it. He deserves it uh, for so many reasons. And that's one of the reasons. But for this fight, this is where I'm going to make people kind of sit up a little bit and, and say, did he just say that? <clears throat> I, I think this is a very dangerous fight for Paul. I I think early on, early on, I think he might be making a mistake. Because, first of all, for me, he, he don't got a lot other than money, and he's made plenty of money. He's There's not a lot 
to win, winning on his side because if he wins, they say he's 58 years old. Yep. You know, that's right. And if he loses, they say he's 58 years old. You lost to a 58 year old guy. For, for me, he's got a lot more to lose than Tyson. Oh, for and, sure. A lot more. I mean, Tyson, you know, whatever they're paying him, he get, he's been making good money. You know, he, he's come back, like I said, in his life. He's done a good job. Uh, him and the people around him, uh, I, I guess his wife is part of that, obviously, where they've done a good job uh, to get him on the track they've gotten him on. And he seems to be in a good place in all ways. You know, I know at one point he owed the government and everything. He seems to be well past that. That's in his rearview mirror. Yep. Where he's he's made plenty of money again in his career. But there's nothing to lose for Tyson. If he wins, like, he's even bigger than, you know, in some way, wow, he, people are going to thank him. Thank you for ending this charade, they're going to say. Thank you for <laughs> teaching this That's guy right. that you're either a fighter or you're not a fighter. You can't go from being a YouTuber to, to being a fighter. For the people that believe that, that feel that way, that don't like Paul, they're going to they're gonna prop up Tyson even higher and say, thanks for teaching these guys a lesson. You know, don't come into your business. Don't come into boxing if you weren't a boxer, if you didn't pay your dues from the beginning, all that stuff, which I don't think is fair completely. But I get it. I get it. A lot of people feel that way about Joshua, that they're thankful. And I get that. I even brought it up, that he, that he helped the sport of boxing. To, to He stood up for the sport of boxing by knocking out Nganyu, an MMA, fight, MMA fighter, again, showing that, hey, uh, MMA fighter, as talented as he was, if you're going to fight in a boxing ring with only boxing ring, not MMA rules, but only boxing rules, a top fighter is going to beat you. So yeah. wh when he fought that close fight with Fury, people were like, ha, ha, ha. You know, a lot of the MMA fighters say, see, we're better than boxers. So the Joshua fight was for more than himself. In that yeah. way, it was it was to kind of, you know, it was it was for the pride of his sport. For yep. the fans of the sports to say, uh, a MMA fighter or a football player or basketball player or a great athlete in another sport can't come and beat a top fighter because That's you right. haven't done it long enough. You haven't paid the dues. Well, this is the same situation. I'm sure Tyson is a historian. Tyson follows all the great former fighters. Tyson probably in his mind wants to show, hey, you can't be the champion. I don't care how old he is if you weren't a fighter. So in Sorry. that way, I'm sure Tyson will kind of take pride in kind of protecting the reputation of boxing, if you want to put it that way. I'm, I'm sure that he'll take pride in that. Um, I'm, I'm going to make you stand up, your hands stand up again. <laughs> Unless this is a WWE agreement, which I don't know if it is. I never said this before, Ken. You know that. That's right. But uh, because I, uh, the, I think all these fights are legitimate, and they are, and have been. But this one makes me wonder. I, and I'm not questioning the integrity of Paul. Matter of fact, I like his integrity. I like what I've seen from the guy here. When the last fight was Serrano, she didn't fight. He paid everyone their money. He he gave. Yeah. He had no choice. I get it. But he gave refunds to. He's been pretty straightforward. So I'm not quite. But I'm just saying, if there was a time I would question it, this would be the time because I can't see, unless Paul's that confident that Tyson is too old now and he's that good because Paul's been getting more confident and Paul does have a good right hand and he does punch well with it and Tyson does lead with left hooks. Maybe Paul thinks he can hit him with a right hand in between. I don't, I don't know. All I know is this is the first time I've actually said, I wonder if there's an agreement because if there's no agreement, Paul might be making a mistake. Now, look, he's like would have hit Tyson, 58 years old, reaching in with a left hook, hit him on the chin, and, and, and knock him out. Tyson was knocked out a couple of times at the end of his career before he was 58. And then people are going to say, oh, wow, look at Paul. And, it, and it'll wind up being a genius move. But yeah. 
I think that it's. I think the risk might be greater than the reward. I I am really surprised in that way. I think I laid out all scenarios of yep. the possibilities, but I am surprised that Paul's taking this risk. I don't know if it's because of his confidence or he he just really does feel Tyson is uh, that much, you know, obviously that deteriorated at this point in his life where he he could handle it. But I'm saying you better you better be aware the way I would be, knowing Tyson the way I do. Power doesn't disappear even when you're old. He's still got speed combination. He's still got that style and that teaching that he was taught to make you miss and create openings for that power. See, he still has that where he can weave, he can slip, he can he can create the openings uh, yeah. to to give himself the possibility to unload a bomb on your chin and get yep. you out of there. Uh, yeah. uh, unless uh, uh, no agreement. Agreement set aside. No agreement, no funny business. Dangerous, dangerous, risky. I give him credit, but a risky fight for Paul, uh, especially early. Yeah. Especially early. Well, because that early bring on. In the eyeballs. Because the first couple rounds, Tyson's going to come out there. Yep. And and if you do have an agreement with him, ha ha ha. Good luck. That's a good point. Be because I know Tyson. Good luck. Because when that bell rings, he 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 might have a short memory about any agreement other than the agreement to put a figure, put put one of those hands on your chin, because he's good in a point. ring. And that's yeah. how he looks at it. He's in a ring, you know. And I'm in a ring. I'm I'm not in here for agreements. I'm that's here it. to I'm here to go and knock somebody, you know, into the other dimension if I can. And one last yeah. thing, I, I, I'm, somebody told me about a couple, you know, they're building it up, they're promoting it, right? And and Tyson has put out a couple of, uh, I guess, videos, uh, looking good in the gym, and then basically, uh, you know, saying to Paul, you made a mistake, and you know, doing what Tyson does, intimidating yeah. yep. type tactic. Tyson is, he's as good as that. He's as good at that as he is in hurting people with his combinations. He's just, That's for he's sure. just as, he always has been. I mean, he's been an intimidator in the lines of a Sonny Liston, of Roberto Duran. You know, he knows how to intimidate and he knows what it can do for him. He knows right. that it can break a guy down before the first bell even rings. So yeah. he's he's either doing that and he's doing it at a high level again, or he's just promoting the fight. Or a combination yeah. of both. But anyway, uh I I just think that it's a I think it has danger for Paul. Yeah. Well, um it was a slow week this week, but before we sign off, I just want to get your thoughts on our friend Ryan Garcia. Very troubling to see what he's going through. Like I said, he's been on the show before. He's a friend of ours. Um, it's hard to watch him behave in the way he's behaving. It, you know, at times he reminds me a little bit of like Tiafimo Lopez in the sense that they're nice kids. I don't understand why, why they're doing what they're doing. I I, I, I don't know. It, it, you would think someone is going to step in at some point and take his – take his social media to ask him to take a break from the social media. You're not helping yourself. It's, it's not helping at all. Um, it's not helping to build the fight. It's actually raising concerns and just, it is helping. It is helping. That's where I disagree. Ken, I get what you're saying from a responsible standpoint, you're talking right, but it is helping. It is helping build the fight. There's more interest in the fight now out of curiosity, out of morbid curiosity. It's it's almost so. like the people. It's almost yeah. like I hate to see this, say this, but it's a it's a bad human characteristic. It's one of our weaker char. We have great, great, strong characteristics as human beings, and we got plenty of weak ones. It's just a matter of which one we allowed to dominate, which one we allowed to be seen, which one we allowed to go out there and control or not control. It, it, it's like the weakness of the human character where 
You'll, you'll be stopped for two hours on a highway and wonder what the freaking blockage is until you get up there two hours later and you see it was a terrible accident. Everybody yeah. stopped to rubberneck. Everybody stopped to gawk at the accident. That's a, that is one of the weaker parts of our human nature, that we have a morbid curiosity to see somebody in pain. Now, not that we want to see them, but to see what it looks like, to, to peek at it, to see, you know, to, to see something that, that, that could be, that's ugly, that's dangerous, that's, you know, that, uh, again, that, that's even sad that, that we'll be drawn to look at. It. Not, that we, not that we want it or, you know, are going to, uh, you know, that, not that we're going to rejoice in it, but just our morbid curiosity to see something that's morbid, something that's, yeah. that's you know, that's, that, that hurt. see what it looks like to see somebody hurt. And yeah. th there's a lot of that going on right now. I read somewhere he was gaining like 5,000 uh, 5, new followers every hour. Every hour. <laughs> That's crazy. So where with these crazy posts that are going. So there, there has been, I said it two weeks ago, there has been thought by some people, and right away you dismiss it, you say, come on. These, these things are too outrageous, they're too crazy, uh, uh, that uh, he's having a manic episode, which I think he is. But there's plenty of people out there saying he's building a fight up. He's building up his social media. This is a kid who, you got to remember, he was one of the only boxers out there that really was into social media, that was really advanced with it, really understood it. He had 9 million followers. I don't know how many he's got now. He obviously understands that world he understands that world but he also obviously likes that world he works at understanding that world can help him in different areas make him more known make him more famous m make him more money nothing wrong with that smart kid a good looking yeah, kid a ten and a half million followers on instagram yeah so he probably gained a million and a half but because i think it was around nine yeah. But whatever it is, he there's a lot of people that thought, hey, he's doing this to build a social media, build the fight up even big, get more pay per view. Look, I think whether that was a thought, not a thought, I don't, I I push that aside. I think the kid is in dire straits. I think I the too. kid, I think he's in a bad place. He's showing stuff of himself, drinking, smoking weed, he's talking about taking hallucinogenics, saying his therapist said to take them. I, I mean, what therapist are you using? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, really, maybe you better go get Shaman. another therapist, buddy. Yeah. Really. And, and he, all this crazy, but not just crazy, concerning. If, if you're half a human being, you have to be worried about him. You have to be concerned about him. I know I am, just as a human being. Yep. I don't pretend to be as going out to dinner with him uh, ten, five nights a week. I'm just saying, as a human being, you hate to see somebody in peril, in distress. Yeah. And he seems to be in peril. He seems to be in distress from a mental, emotional standpoint. And i say this. That from everything we've seen, if the New York State Athletic Commission, I said this before, I'll say it again. If they don't step in, I know there was a post out there, they said something. I don't want to hear that. I want something tangible, something real, something solid. If they don't step in and mandate that this kid gets evaluated by doctors that, they, that they've put forward psychiatric people, doctors, professional people in that field, if they don't force him to see some of these doctors that they that you know that they're attached to, that That's that, right. that, uh, that they can say, okay, after this evaluation, at least we're we'll feel better one way or the other of what direction to go in. If they don't do that they should be shut down. And I'll, you know what? I might work at shutting them down. I, I mean it. I might yeah. work at shutting them down. Because if they, if they don't 
if there's ever a need for a commission, it's now with a kid That's like right. this. A commission's first job is to protect a fighter, to make sure the fighter is physically and mentally in a proper condition before they get into a, that place called the squared circle, into that dangerous place. Yes, dangerous place. Before they get in there, that they are fit physically and mentally. For what we've been seeing for the last month or close to a month, does not suggest that Ryan Garcia is fit to get in a ring, not to mention with a top fighter like Devin Haney, to, on yeah. top of it. And so that's the first thing. If the comm commission in New York, I believe, is funded by taxpayers' money, yeah. why are we funding this? Why, is, why do they exist if they don't do their job in a case like this, what is the use for them? Really, there, there is point. no use. And and then I don't want to hear Jose Suleiman posting <laughs> something saying, oh, yeah, you know, I've talked to the commission. You talk to the commission? No, the commission, <laughs> you're not a commission. You're, you're a sanctioned organization. You're, you're not a commission. You want guys to get in the ring so you can take your sanction and fee. Maybe you got a heart. I'm not knocking you. Maybe you do care about his well-being. Fine. But that's not your job. That's the commission's job. That is, not right. what you, that is not what you do for a living. What you do for a living is you rate and sanction fights and get paid a commission for doing it. That's what you do. But and, and then some people say, well, at least they're showing they care. Uh, showing they care. Where they show they care. They don't have the power. <laughs> To show they they are they bringing psychiatrists in there where we can see on a public forum what the results of those psychiatric tests are if there are psychiatric evaluations going on which should go on no so please I don't want to hear that you know that that a guy like Suleiman is oh he's showing concern sometimes fans are great sometimes they're so smart they really are I I do a show pro box with former champion Paulie Malinaji and and Chris Algier and I loved them and I love doing the show and I got to tell you I uh, Paulie both of them but Paulie shoots it straight and I love him for that and he says sometimes, and the more he says it, and I look, I say, you know what? You can't argue with him. Sometimes he'll go out there and he'll say, hey, look, I'm known for saying things really straight and really to the point and, and sometimes that people don't like to hear too. Uh, yeah, I get it. That's why I get haters. I got lovers, haters, in between, whatever. Uh, same thing for Paulie. But when he shoots it straight, here, quite often, when we get into a, uh, a, 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 of a something to to talk about that might be a contentious subject, here here make this statement. He say, "I tell you, there's a lot of stupid fans out there," and and I I try I I try not to go down there too much. But man, Paulie, you are so right. You are so. <laughs> You are so right. I mean, look, the smart fans, I'm the first one to say you're the smartest boxing fans or the smartest sport fans there are. When, when, uh, when you're out there, you know, controlling your, controlling your, your fanatical uh, right to be a fanatic, when you control that a little bit, which it's your right, you're a fan, and you use this and you actually – know something about the sport, you've invested in the sport, you've watched the sport, you've learned. Some of you are very smart, and I give you credit for that, but there are some out there that are so stupid. They are, <laughs> they really are, and I see why Paul gets frustrated, because I get frustrated, and I'm like, like some of them, they say the stupidest things. I mean, like really ridiculous things. That's one of the downsides of social media is it gives a, a microphone to a lot of knuckle nuts. And it's so easy for some of these guys to get swayed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so glad Jose is getting involved. Getting involved in what? <laughs> oh, that, that he's what? What are you talking about? He wants to make sure the fight goes on so he gets his <laughs> sanction and fee. What, a big money how, st how stupid are you? Uh, until... Until somebody like Suleiman shows up with a bunch of doctors to say, hey, if he doesn't pass this test, 
uh, the the W uh, my organization. What's his organization? WBC. WBA, WBC. My organization, WBC. Until the, he takes a test, we're not sanctioning. The others can <laughs> sanction it, but yeah, we're but not. A chance of hitting the lottery. Until he does that. Please, you idiot fans, don't tell me how he's, oh, my God, he's so uh, caring. And he's so, stop it. Stop it with any of that. And the same thing for the New York Commission. I don't want to hear a blanket statement out there that, that puts a post up and saying we're concerned about, concerned, then show you concern. Exactly. Get doctors there to examine this kid. Really? That, that's, that's pretty much what, that pretty much sums it up. At the very least, if you're trying to get your head around this, what, what's going on besides a very strong possibility the kid's having a psychotic episode, a manic episode, whatever way you want to define it. But whatever it is, I think it's hard to dispute what I'm about to say. He's crying out for help. Yep, that's exactly right. And, and Ken... He ain't getting it. That's he's right. crying out. And and you know what? Maybe he's in too deep with his emotions and every, where he's at. And it really doesn't want to fight. He's a tough kid. He's a brave kid. I'm not challenging his heart. I'm not doing that. He's a fighter. I don't challenge any fighter's heart. But maybe because of where he is emotionally, the pressure got to him. It happens. Making the money, fighting the top guys now. Whatever it is. You know, he's not that far removed from being knocked out by Tank Davis. With all of this, and now he's fighting another top guy, maybe with all of this, he felt that he had to do this. And then yep. once he did it, it happens to people. It, 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 it probably happened to you. It's happened to me. It's happened probably to everyone listening. You get in and then you realize, you think back and you say, wait a minute, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Maybe That's right. I, that's exactly that. I would say that's exactly what's going on. That's my belief, but you know. And if it is Ken, and he's crying out because there's no other way. Because a fighter, what's he going to say? Uh, I'm not fighting. He can't say that because then that's he'd right. be labeled that, and he doesn't want that. So maybe he's not in the right place psychologically, mentally, and he's crying out for help, and he's crying out also for help before this fight. And I think we need to listen to him. And and I'll make this point. You've been there. You've seen this. Where you're seeing a fight where a fighter wants to get out of a fight. But he's not going to quit because that's not acceptable because he's got to live with that. And that's hard to live with. So he wants to get out and the doctor comes over. Yeah. And the doctor says, how how's you, how you doing? How you feel? How's your eye? <laughs> and, and then and then the fighter might say, might, we've seen it. We've seen it. I'm not making yeah, stuff up. Right. I know. Might, say, exactly right. might say, in a very low tone, he might say, I, I can't see. Soon as he says that, he knows what he's doing. Yep. He knows that the doctor has no choice but to stop the fight. He knows that. That's right. He didn't say, I quit. And then sometimes you might see the fighter say, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, we're stopping the fight. But why are you stopping? <laughs> exactly. Why? Because, you know, because that was his way of getting out when he didn't think he could handle it. What I'm saying here, there's a possibility. And again, I am not questioning his manhood. I'm just saying he's a fighter. He gets in the ring. 99% of the people can't do that on this planet. But yep. what I'm saying is there's a possibility that by crying out, it's he. It's similar to the fighter in the corner when the doctor says, "How you feel?" and he says, "I can't see," and he yeah. knows that it's got to be stopped. By I by putting these posts up, I find it hard to believe that he would think that it could lead to anything other than more views and more more followers. I get it. More pay-per-view. I get it. But other than that, I can't see how by putting these outrageous, crazy posts up that really make you worried about him, 
yeah. how he how he feels it could lead to anything other than a commission, a responsible commission. And we're going to find out if New York is responsible. I don't know if they are, but I can't see it leading to anything but a doctor and a commission saying, we can't let this fight go on. No, we can't. Right. I, 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 what could it lead? If, what could it lead to? If this fight goes, I'll finish with this. If this fight continues with no intervention by the commissions and the powers that be, that are, their responsibility is to look out for the welfare of a fighter, if that happens, this sport is an uncivilized sport. I've been in it 50 years. I know it's a rough sport. I know it's a tough sport. I know it's a dangerous sport. But then it becomes an uncivilized sport. And yeah. we can't have uncivilized anything in our civilized society. You, you can't. I know we're getting uncivilized behavior now. and was, That's got to be eradicated. It has to be. It has to be. If we're going to continue as, as, as a civilized people, it has to be. Yeah. Because it's, it's a small percentage of people that are acting with that be, within that behavior. It has yeah. to be eradicated. Well, hopefully they're going to step in and, and evaluate him at the very least and provide a report, not necessarily for the public, but just okay the fight after after a full evaluation. If, if they don't, Ken, it, it could lead to the downfall of boxing across the board. Nobody's thinking about this. It, it could lead to the closing of the commission in New York. I think it will. Because God forbid something happens to this kid. But God forbid he goes in that ring and and something really bad happens because it's dangerous. Anything can, tough things, difficult, bad things can happen. The fighters understand that. That's the okay. inherent nature of the sport. They understand. But what's not understood ever before is to go in there in this kind of mental condition and then you enhance the chance of something very dangerous and bad happening. If that happens, if that happens, for, forget about the lawsuit that New York, they're going to have a lawsuit that will close them down, will close them down. Then you will see the people around him that haven't acted, that haven't stepped up to the plate, that haven't come forward when they needed to. They're going to come forward then with lawsuits. They will come forward then. That's right. Because and say, why did you let him get in the ring? Why did why did you not do something before this happened? And there is a pre there is a precedent. And I'm gonna leave with this because Rob's gonna put it up, Ken. There's a clip that Rob's gonna put up so the people watching will understand why I'm so serious about this. Why why I am so passionate about this. Oliver McCall got in the ring years ago in the second fight rematch with Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight champ of the world. He McCall had knocked him out in their first fight. McCall went through a lot after that. He went through drug and alcohol issues. Uh, he was a good fighter. He was a spawn partner for Tyson early on, and he became a tremendous fighter in his own right. He knocked out Lennox Lewis uh, in, in their first fight, and he had a lot of personal issues going on. And leading up to the rematch with Lennox Lewis, he wound up being put into a, I, I don't know if I'm 100% correct, but I know I'm right there and close enough he wound up being put into, I, I don't know if he was in a psych, psychiatric, um, uh, if, if there was a psychiatric evaluation that was part of it, or a psychiatric, uh, you know, uh, um, place that, uh, treatment center, if that was part of it. But what I do know is he was in a drug rehab Maybe, it might have been drug and detox, but it was definitely some kind of drug rehab facility. He was actually in there a couple of weeks prior to the fight. Can Dang. you imagine? No, he was I actually can't. Ken, 
He was actually, you know, tough it is to get in the ring to begin with yeah, and what you got to deal with and how you got to be focused, how you got to control your, your mind, your emotions, everything so your body can be used the right way. How, I mean, very few people can do, especially talk about fighting a heavyweight champ of the world who can punch like hell, like Lennox Lewis with the right hand. And, yeah. and, and, and it's a very big heavyweight. But he had, I think he, if, if my memory serves me correct, he might have even trained his last week or two from the from the drug rehab center, where Jeez. where he was actually I don't know if he was going home at night or he was going in and out, whatever. But he actually some of his training, I believe, was attached to his time being in that facility, as I said prior to the to the fight. Wow. And here's what happened. And Rob's putting it up. In the fight, I don't remember, it was the second round, first round. It was early in the fight. Third round. What do you think happens? He breaks down. He has yeah, an emotional. Ken, he has an emotional breakdown in the middle of the ring and starts crying. Yeah. I mean, if your, heart, if your heart didn't go out to this kid, then you don't have a heart. That's right. He he started crying. And as he started breaking down, Lewis hit him a right hand because Lewis didn't know what was going on. Of course. And he hit him a right hand. You know what the right hand did to him? Nothing. It's like he didn't even feel it. Like he didn't care because the pain inside him was a lot freaking greater than the right hand could ever deliver. Ever deliver. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a good example. You're right. I remember that now when he broke down. Very sad. Well, I hope that they get Ryan, uh, at the very least, an evaluation. I hope he's okay because I do think he's a really nice kid. I would go to the New York State Commission right now and say, do you want this? You want this? This We had a similar situation. We had a guy he wasn't posting. The social media wasn't what it is now anyway. Right. But, but – he wasn't posting, but he, he was in a drug rehab. He had all kinds of things going on in his life. He was allowed to go. Obviously, people around him didn't look out for him. He was allowed to go in the ring, and look what happened. Look yeah. what happened. Do you want this to happen again and maybe worse? Yeah, good point. And there's well, only one thing in the advantage of Garcia. There's nothing in the advantage of Garcia now, but there's one thing that... My son reminded me of today, Ken. Devin Haney, and I'm surprised he took the fight on the calendar the way he did, but it shows you he's so confident. He's a champion. He wants to get in there and fight, and he wants to prove himself. And it was before any of this stuff came out with this behavior of Garcia. But Haney is training. He's a devout Muslim, and he's training during Ramadan. You know how hard you know how That's, hard that is. Of course, I I, I, I tell day. you the truth. I'm shocked. I am shocked that he's training during Ramadan. But all credit to him. I mean, the guy's a fighter. You can't take yeah. it away. Hate hate him or love him. The guy's a freaking fighter. But yep. that that could be an X factor if yeah. if this wasn't going on. But I tell you, with this stuff going on, uh. I I just pray that he's okay. I want to. I just want to throw out a couple of results real quick uh, for the fans out there. Dillian White came back. Uh, he fought. I know he was supposed to fight Joshua, but I think he tested positive again, uh, right for PEDs or something. Yeah. Whatever, whatever. He fought under the radar Sunday, yesterday. Uh, today's Monday. To, when this comes out, it'll be Tuesday. But Sunday in Ireland. He fought, uh, obviously, on a very obscure card in Ireland. He came back and he fought 36-year-old Christian Hammer, whose record is 27-10, and 10, and he's been knocked out five times. I guess you could make it six now. Um, yep. But he, he, Hammer basically, I guess, submitted. I won't say quit, but I guess his obviously it's obvious what he did uh after the third round he didn't come out of his corner uh yep. and from what i saw 
and from what I read, but I watched some of it, it was it was not a good performance. I mean, White didn't look White didn't look too great, but they they picked this hammer. Uh, they did it in Ireland again, off the radar, and White got a a third round knockout. I guess it's technically a third round knockout. Um, he he. Uh, I, I tell you, there's a picture. Rob's gonna put it up there. Uh, if if for nothing else, a little bit of <laughs> a, a little. It speaks to where the fight was. I don't know if it was a pub in Ireland or a hotel or a nightclub. I'm not sure. But obviously they couldn't find the fight stool. So they found something to put in a corner for him to sit on. And when when Rob puts this picture up, Ken, I'm going to tell you, you, you know what it looks like? A bar stool, like a, it's this big. I mean, it, the, <laughs> his, sure it was. Dayan White is not a small guy. He's at least six five, right? He's somewhere in yeah. that area. Big yeah. guy, uh, you know. And I think he was like two hundred fifty six pounds for the fight, whatever it was. But he, his feet are, are, are off the ground by like a foot. Oh his feet God. are off the ground by a foot. He's sitting on the stool. And some of the fans' comments were, "You did you bring it back to the bar afterwards?" <laughs> the, I mean, that's that. Or, or just the you know that old saying: it does it doesn't have a good look. Yeah, it, it didn't have. It had a funny look, but it didn't have a good look. The other result is uh, for all the fans, the, the rapid fans, the crazy fans, they have to get every bit of the boxing news possible. I'm here to make sure you get it. So Joe Joyce knocked out Cash Alley, who's 21 and 3, 32 years old. Joe Joyce, his first fight back after two straight losses to uh, Zhang, the, the Chinese heavyweight who just lost to Joe Parker. Yeah. Um, Joyce as I said, he knocked out Cash Alley, uh, and um, Joyce, he scored the knockout with seconds left, I think, in the 10th round. It, uh, it was one-sided, but it looked like uh, Alley was going to survive, and then with a very short period of time left in the 10th round, Joyce got scored a big right hand, and he got the knockout. Joyce came in close to 290 pounds. I wow. think the heaviest of his career. He didn't look good. All I can tell you, again, for the, for, the, yeah, for the people that want to get a little report on him, what are you going to say? <laughs> He's still the ponderous, you know, tough guy that keeps coming forward, keeps coming forward. He didn't have anything really in front of him for, for the most part, but he kept coming forward, very ponderous, very predictable, and uh, wide punches, and he's right there to get hit. Even with Cash yeah. Alley, who wasn't prepared to do a lot, he hit him with a lot of big shots. Whenever he threw a big right hand, he led. So I don't know what the future is for Joyce. I know there's fans out there that want there to be a future for him, but at this point in his career, uh, in his late 30s, you know, he had he was a silver medalist from the Olympics. You know, he, he again, tough guy, uh, a, a guy that you wanted to see do good. He walks in, he throws bombs. Uh, if he 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 had a granite chin for a while until he ran into Zhang, and then Zhang wound up uh, stopping him, and the granite chin wasn't so granite anymore. Yeah, that's right. But but that's he's right. just. Uh, it's the same thing. Slow footed, walks in, easy to hit, uh, one punch at a time, bombs away. I, I don't see anybody in the. He only wants to fight in the top now. After this, I mean, yeah, what course. what else are you going to do? I mean, you're yeah. you're not going to be around so you can fight these kind of fights. So yeah. you got. I can't think in my mind who he can beat. I know. No, it wasn't, I, yeah, I agree with you. It's 
it's he's and I don't want to hear I don't want to hear Joe Parker because I know that he did beat Parker, but that was that was a couple years ago already. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how far, but that was a couple years ago, and Parker is a whole different animal, if you will. He's of a course. whole different fighter right now, and yep. and unfortunately, so is Joe Joyce. So yep, anyway, I agree. One thing I wanted to mention, Teddy, is a special shout out to our friends at Athletic Greens. I'm traveling today. That means I've got my travel packs with me. You can get 10 free travel packs of Athletic Greens by going to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Use the promo code Atlas. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink made from 75 whole food source ingredients. These guys developed this formula along with the input from several uh, doctors. Uh, all, like I said, everything sourced from Whole Foods, which is the best way to get all your vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas and take advantage of the 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Teddy, we got a lot in here for a slow week. Thank you for doing this. Uh, Appreciate no you as Good always. Luck. And Good luck. Uh, best of luck with your surgery. Yeah, they gave me my orders with the surgery. I could only take... A baby aspirin, which I take, you know, regular for mm-hmm. your heart, whatever. Um, baby aspirin, a lot of people are going to be glad to hear why I take it because there's a, the, I just ended the, the rumors that I don't have a heart. Yeah, I take a baby <laughs> aspirin for my heart. Yes, uh, you heard it right. Yeah. Um, they told me I could take a baby aspirin and I could take my medication for cholesterol. I take a... I got to get my cholesterol a down. Yeah, yep. so a statin. So I could take those two things, but I'm going to add one. I'm going to add athletic greens. Definitely. Well, thanks thanks again for doing this. Um, appreciate all the fans for being with us. Please like and subscribe to the YouTube video. It helps us massively. And we'll be back next week to get an update on Teddy's surgery and all the fight action per usual. Have a great week, everybody. Boom.